Good afternoon or good evening, good morning. We'll be starting uh, shortly, so settle in. Um, please use the chat box to say hello and tell us where you're from and make sure you grab the drop down box that says panelist and attendees because we're all keen to hear where you're from. We will be starting shortly. So settle in, looking forward to this session on the impact of geopolitics on supply chain post COVID-19. Welcome to the SIPS Australia and New Zealand webinar on the topic of the impact of geopolitics on supply chain post COVID-19. I'd like to advise everyone that this webinar is currently being recorded and will be made available to you all the following uh, during next week. So now a warm welcome to you all. Um, my name is Sharon Morris and I'm General Manager of SIPS Australia and New Zealand and I'll be your host for today. But first, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the many lands we meet on today and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Tinakoko, Tinakoko, Tinakoko Katawa for those participating from New Zealand. For those who don't know who SIPS is, the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply, or SIPS, is your global professional body for procurement and supply professionals. We're dedicated to promoting best practice and continuous improvement in professional standards, and also raising awareness of the contribution that procurement and supply management can make to organisations and really the community at large. So a warm welcome again to everyone to our webinar and I'm thrilled that approximately 200 people are registered today. But let's first begin with our Zoom housekeeping notices. All attendees have been muted during the presentation. However, we do ask that you use the chat box to write any comments you have or that you'd like to share with panellists or attendees. And if you have any specific questions, you may wish to um, address directly to us, to the panellists and myself, then the Q&A box is where you should go and we'll address those questions and an with answers at the end of the session. So just use the Q&A box for any questions. In today's webinar, we will be discussing the impact of geopolitics on supply chains and I'm really pleased to say we're, we're joined by two exports experts um, and exports as well, <laughs> um, Corrie Davey and Steve Wilford. Steve will discuss how the changing geopolitical landscape will impact the broader global outlook of supply chains and it'll take us through what we need to consider to monitor, manage and mitigate these risks to strengthen your overall supply chain resilience. Well, Corey will join us for our Q&A session today, so don't forget to put those questions into the Q&A box. Now allow me to introduce you to our presenters for today's webinar. Corey Davis, Davey is a partner and the head of the control risk business for Australia Pacific. Based out of Sydney, she leads the client services team across Australia Pacific based clients. Corey is supporting Australian companies as they look to enter new markets, strengthening their compliance and resilience and managing critical business issues. We'll look forward to speaking further with Corey at the Q&A session later. Our main presenter for today is Steve Wilford. Steve is a partner in Control Risk's global risk analysis team, where he leads a group of specialist analysts conducting country, sector and regulatory risk assessment work. Steve is often asked to talk on BBC, CNN, CNBC and also SIPS today, as well as in print media on trends, insurgency, political succession, corporate governance and threats to business assets in the Asia Pacific. He is also a frequent presenter at regional risk management conferences. Thank you, Steve, for joining us and I'm gonna hand over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Sharon, and, and, and thank you to SIPS for, for, for having me. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm actually sat in my study, still on lockdown in in Singapore. So apologies if it's a little bit a little bit dark. Um, 
So to the sort of the sub subheading of, of today's presentation, I'm just going to spend maybe uh, 20 to 30 minutes of just uh, a formal chat behind some slides uh, discussing uh, supply chain uh, responses to the to the new normal, I've called it. As we know, that's already quite a hackneyed term, new normal. Uh, new abnormal is another one that's banded around complete departure with the with the past um, uh, all of these phrases occupy the headlines uh, that we're reading at the moment um, and my my assertion is actually that you know aside from styles of consumption perhaps that are going to be quite fundamentally changed by um, by the the experience of the, of the pandemic I think for us in uh, Asia Pacific, really all that COVID-19 has done is actually just accelerate a lot of, uh, to use the language of COVID, it's just accelerated a lot of pre-existing conditions. And I'm going to talk about what I feel those are, um, how important uh, perhaps people uh, dealing with supply chain should be, should be weighting those in their thinking and and just finish off with some suggestions just based on our benchmarked experience of, of dealing with uh, uh, dozens of clients across dozens of sectors who are facing the supply chain challenges in this in this highly fluid uh, environment that we're living in right now so i'm i'm aided and abetted this afternoon by sophia pereira who's going to do do the slide transitions for me so sophia if you could just move over to to the next slide Thank you. Um, I'm not going to bore you with the whole uh, biography of, of, of control risks. I think just to keep it in context, um, you know, we're a professional services firm that, that's, that's, um, that's focused on operational and strategic risk. And quite frankly, and you may find this interesting, that if I go back to December uh, 2019, when nobody had heard of COVID-19, uh, and look at the admix of work that we were doing in Asia then, um, and look at the admix of work that we're doing in Asia now, I would, uh, I would suggest that actually the, the, the profile of it hasn't really changed that much at all, which you might find quite surprising. We've had a lot of conversations uh, with clients around crisis management planning, um, around remediation, uh, in in terms of uh, supply chain closures and in fewer cases supply chain openings um, in new in new markets but not as much as you actually might think the key themes that have kept my department running um, in in the in the in the first quarter have been problem solving uh, that's a real catch-all term around uh, essentially our clients facing all sort of manner of micro business disruption from officialdom regulators etc from Indonesia to Vietnam to India um, stakeholder mapping that's another fancy phrase of, of, of our clients really needing to know who's who in the zoo and I think if you're in supply chain that's a really a really crucial element of your operations in, in Asia just having that heads up as to actually who and what are coming at you, uh, particularly in these interesting times. And then uh, another phrase that I've made up uh, is uh, future proofing. Um, and all that means is that a lot of our clients in this region, and especially actually Australia and New Zealand, are, are giving controllers the essay question, how do I protect my, my supply chain? How do I protect my, my, my business more broadly over the over the the medium to long term and that question as will not surprise you has been particularly focused on china given the way that geopolitics is washing over the that marketplace uh, but not only there because it has knock-on consequences for the rest of south and southeast asia and that is really the the the, the, the broad focus of our focus of our work so sort of based on our, on our benchmarked experience of dealing with clients across those areas, I want to talk to you about uh, supply chain risk uh, and geopolitics and how it's impacting it. So if we move on, just staying with COVID briefly, this is uh, what uh, um, our uh, de-escalation index, uh, a, 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 an unfortunately pretty patchwork 
quilt of different colors from green meaning less restrictive lockdown procedures to to red much more restrictive um by the way if if you'd like me to share the the broader monitor that we that we produce uh, uh weekly on on covid this is just a little component of it i'd be happy to share that with you um after after this uh, this conversation but uh the salient feature of this picture um, is of course that some of these colours, if you take if you take the light tan of Australia there, uh, last week it was a, it was or, or the week before it was a slightly more greenish hue, and that of course reflects the fact that you know our transition through COVID is not linear, it's going forwards, it's going backwards uh, from Israel to Australia to uh, parts of Latin America. We're seeing lock lockdown provisions reimposed after them uh, after them being being lifted um, and uh, how economies um, with their supply chains um, are going to recover from pandemic is of course a political thing you know you look at that map the whole world has COVID-19 now um, but uh, in terms of policy uh, uh, response to this to this terrible disease um, as we know, the, the variation is, is extraordinary and the outcomes as a consequence of that uh, are extraordinary, both economic um, and political. So, you know, the key features in geopolitical terms of, of COVID-19 have been um, really the supremacy of national policy um, uh, over na uh, global collaboration, the supremacy of national policy over compliance with international norms, the supremacy of the national over the whole concept of, of globalization on which we've built our supply chain uh, concepts uh, over the past two decades. And uh, COVID has really brought this into stark relief. Uh, and that, of course, makes for a much more complex world for us trying to deal with our, with our supply chain risk. Um, but it's important uh, to note that you know this 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 multicolored world of economic nationalism, unilateralism, uh, new pressures to onshore uh, discussions about national security now, um, uh, and the need for supply chain resilience more so probably over um, supply chain efficiency as we previously sort of constituted it. Um, these are all pre-existing. Uh, these are all pre-existing things. COVID hasn't created them. It's just brought them into relief and speeded a number of these trends up. So if you move on to the next slide, uh, just, I thought you might find this interesting. Um, this is actually put together by our colleagues at uh, Oxford uh, Economics. Uh, and it's a, I would say, a, a semi-scientific uh, 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 attempt to measure the quality of recovery. It's got a fascinating methodology sitting behind it. You don't hear that banded around very much. Methodologies often are not fascinating, but in this case it really is. And again, I'll, I'm, I'm happy to share that. Um, but what this measures is essentially uh, the quality of recovery on the, on the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis is the percentage change in second half uh, GDP predictions between now and and last December, as an, as analysed by by Oxford Economics, and what it comes up with is a is a a, a linear graph of um, of where economies in the region are doing in terms of their recovery scorecard, and I think this is an interesting mirror actually of supply chain risk as well, so to very briefly analyze it, I mean, it doesn't come as a surprise that China, Taiwan, South Korea uh, are, are right at the sort of top of the, top of the, of the and, and Hong Kong uh, are, are at the top of the, um, of the, of the charts, if you like, up there, because they were characterized, uh, particularly Taiwan, South Korea, and Hong Kong, they were characterized by really quite aggressive policy responses to COVID coupled with actually relatively light touch um, um, lock, lockdown provisions um, and a real sort of social mobilization of response to it, resulting in um, quite positive uh, healthcare outcomes and, and also 
a relatively limited relatively limited impact uh, on their economies. China, China's lockdown, lockdown, as we know, was the first and, and, and to this day remains extremely rigid. Um, uh, and its actual social policy response has been relatively uh, quite weak. Uh, but because it took that, that, that early action, it actually remains uh, quite high up there. The interesting one, I think, for, for those of you in supply chain thinking about your China plus one strategy is Vietnam, of course. And Vietnam is unique because uh, not only did it uh, minimize deaths from COVID to almost nothing, uh, and not only did it not lock down its economy in the way that um, uh, many, of its, many of its neighbors did, it didn't actually throw that much cash at this problem. It was very parsimonious um, and yet extremely successful in, in, in managing the, the pandemic. And of course, as we know, that has put Vietnam at the top of the headlines in terms of uh, where people are looking to diversify their supply chain or even uh, relocate it. Uh, I, just moving to the back of the graph, um, uh, uh, if you look at uh, Philippines and India, uh, a number of our clients uh, based there have really had quite significant problems with the supply chain because quite frankly, what's happened there is you have quite populist leaders who implemented extremely rigid lockdowns in the Philippines, in, in, in the case of more Metro Manila than anywhere else, uh, in the case of India countrywide, uh, which resulted in quite significant supply chain um, disruption. But unfortunately, it hasn't been accom accompanied by particularly strong social or, or, or health uh, outcomes, as we know, given the, you know, the, 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 the rising infection rates in, in India right now. And then uh, just to finish off, you have uh, a, a, a bunch of uh, industrializing Southeast Asian states who are sort of ho hovering around the middle. Uh, Australia and New Zealand weren't actually formally measured as part of this. So what I have put them on there as a kind of, uh, as a kind of guesstimate as to relatively uh, speaking where they sit in, in that recovery index. Um, they're sort of drawn down uh, the, if you like the, the the vertical axis by the by the extremity of the of the contraction in 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 uh, H2 GDP growth, uh, but they score relatively well in in terms of uh, in terms of how they they've managed the pandemic, of course. So just moving on to the next slide. Um, continuing with the the um, theme of uh, big winners. Um, I think there's a, just a couple of points to mention here about the region, uh, um, COVID and the uh, importance of COVID to supply chain. The first one I've mentioned, which is uh, it's, really th it's really thrown into relief uh, just where the potential alternatives lie if you're thinking about uh, diversification out of, out of China. Um, and again, uh, Vietnam really is a standout there, although relatively speaking, Thailand didn't do too badly. And Malaysia uh, has, has, been, has been patchy, but not uh, by, by no means disastrous. Indonesia, by contrast, is taking more of a sort of shut your eyes and cross your fingers approach to, to, to COVID-19. But actually, relatively speaking, it seems to have managed to to uh, to ride ride things out um, in relative terms with less damage than, say, for example, India. But the takeaway, uh, uh, based on our clients' experience of of running supply chains during during the time of pandemic, is twofold. First thing is that you really do leave China at your peril. I mean. The, 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 the Australian papers are awash with uh, uh, the, the looming trade war and, and punitive action by China against Australia, etc. But if you're in Australia business, uh, manufacturing components in your supply chain out of Dongguan, uh, what really came 
came to came to into relief during the, the height of pandemic was actually just how well the Chinese uh, did crisis management um, uh, um, of, of supply chain um, at, the, at the height of their pandemic problem. So you walk away from that at your peril. The second thing that's really been brought into relief by the pandemic is you diversify away from China at your peril also. So a number of clients um, uh, had moved into places like Bangladesh, Indonesia, um, India, and the relative experience of managing supply chain during the pandemic there versus China was was so much worse, uh, and that was a, that was a consistent opinion uh, of our clients. The bureaucratic inefficiency, the erratic response, the the, the localized uh, uh, confusion versus uh, national level level edicts were all. Uh, distinctly behind the experience of, of China. So whilst we're all reading about it's time to it's time to you know get out of China and into the into the rest of Asia, that in itself brings risks. And of course at a, at a purely operational le level, saying goodbye to to one key component of your of your supply chain, often that creates risks in terms of dealing dealing with that closure. And then you have the challenge uh, of uh, of developing new third parties, uh, uh, auditing new new sets of vendors, etc., in in new destinations. You know all this, um, but I really, I just wanted to point out that relatively relatively speaking, it's going to be it's going to be harder for you out of China than it is in it. Okay, just move on to the next one. Um, these uh, five things, I would say, if you're thinking about supply chain in geopolitical terms, these are your five buckets that you want to sort of segment your thinking into. And these were actually developed in January when COVID was just a, a twinkle in my analyst eyes, uh, but they still hold very true uh, to, this, to this day. Um, and their geopolitics on the US campaign trail, rising activism, cyber warfare, economic anxiety meets political fragility and tactical global leaders. Briefly, that means, number one, uh, the US presidential election is of profound importance to supply chain. Uh, and the reason why I say that is, um, if we have uh, a second Trump presidency, uh, you can all expect an extrapolation of what we've got now, which is um, uh, a, a real deepening of, this, of, uh, uh, of the somewhat erratic um, US uh, response to the rise of China, um, a fairly grumpy, erratic relationship with allies around the region, probably including uh, Australia and New Zealand, uh, and certainly Japan, India, etc. Um, if you think of a, if you think in terms of a Biden presidency, what you're not going to get uh, emphatically straight out of the of the traps is a resolution of the U.S. China China tensions. It's hardwired into the bipartisan uh, framework of of U.S. politics now. What you will get is uh, a more consistent quote unquote diplomatic approach to it, which provides certainty which will allow those of you trying to make decisions about supply chain location, it will make your lives easier because a, a higher degree of certainty, I feel, will enter into that equation. Factor number two, which is a biggie, possibly one of the, one of the biggest things that is, is going to impact supply chains over the next, uh, of the next five years, is a Biden presidency will realign the United States back towards uh, a more internationalist view on climate change. And that I think will have a huge impact on how companies will be expected to behave in terms of their environmental footprint, how they manufacture. Um, and um, and uh, I'll come back to, come back to that briefly, uh, but I think that's got, gonna have huge implications for all of us. Point number two, rising activism. Uh, 
is um, we've seen it uh, on the streets of the United States. Uh, I think from a supply chain perspective, uh, we're seeing it uh, more uh, in terms of activist shareholders. Um, we're seeing it more in terms of the of the acronym E S and G. Environment, social, and and governance is just being bandied about everywhere at the moment uh, by people with money, um, people with money to spend, and that will have knock-on effects uh, for those of you who are expected to to uh, make sure the supply chain of your businesses ref reflects the, those values. Um, that locks in with my first point about about uh, a real spike in 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 international activity on environmentalism uh, hugely important number three cyber warfare uh, don't be don't be sidetracked by the warfare bit I mean Australia's just uh, experienced a bit of a, a, a bit of a, a state sanctioned cyber cyber attack I and, our, and my clients with a focus on supply chain are more interested in actually the front end. You don't need hackers now to really upset your business. There's so much legislation floating around the region, uh, principally inspired by the China cybersecurity law, that they can just come and take your stuff through the front door. They can walk away with your IP, your servers, your, 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 your data sets, you name it. Uh, so for those of you managing international supply chains, the cyber security element of your data is going to become hugely important um, and how you protect your company against regulatory sanction for misuse of data is, is, is uh, based on the work that we're doing is a real focus now of so many companies in the region. Number four, economic anxiety uh, meets um, political uh, fragility. I mean, really, all I'm saying is here, here is that, you know, renewed economic activity post COVID is not going to lift uh, all ships of state equally. Uh, we're going to see the populists um, going back to India and uh, Narendra Modi or Rodi Duterte in the Philippines. Uh, they're going to try and shore up their positions with more populism. They're actually quite competent administrators. Not all populists are the same. Um, but all populists have the same instincts to be divisive um, and draw on nativism and to a certain extent economic nationalism, which uh, has the potential to create civil unrest um, and uh, provides an opportunity for officialdom to, to move behind that, that, uh, that zeitgeist, if you like, and make life difficult for companies trying to manufacture things. So it does have implications for, for supply chain. And then just the last one, tactical global leader, leaders. Uh, we're seeing, as you know, a lot of countries um, talking about supply chain security now. Uh, it's got to come home. The farmer's got to come home. The biotech's got to come, got to come home. Uh, the dual use technology can't go abroad. Um, it sounds all very noble. Um, but it's also a huge headache for those, for those of us in, involved in supply chain. And it's also borderless. There's, there's, no, there's no defined red line around where uh, a sector that is strategic versus one that is not is concerned uh, in, in most of these jurisdictions. So it's a real challenge for us. Uh, and I would make the point that uh, supply chain security is not the same as supply chain resilience. Bringing all your manufacturing back to Australia uh, is not resilient uh, because as soon as you stop diversifying your sources of production, uh, you're removing a whole set of fail safes, of course, as you know, guys, from, from your supply chain. So there's, there, there is that tension uh, that uh, uh, companies are going to have to increasingly deal with and uh, you're going to have to develop functions if you don't have them already within your business to really engage with governments to ensure that, frankly, they don't mess up. Just uh, moving on to the next one. Um, 
just uh, there's the headlines that just really underline the the, the US-China tensions. I've spent most of my week actually talking to um, uh, mainly Australian businesses about the impact of the, the, the national security law on their footprint in Hong Kong. Uh, the growing threat of sanctions uh, and its implications for, for supply chains um, is only moving in one direction. Just to revisit my point about a Trump versus a, a, a Biden presidency. And this is going to be a, a sanctions risk is going to be an, and regulatory, regulatory risk is going to be a, a, a growing problem. And of course, Australia is at the front line of this. It's, um, it's a middle power, very closely aligned to the United States, highly reliant on the Chinese economy. It's, in my opinion, quite ripe to be used as a, as a, as a football uh, in this standoff and businesses uh, are going to have to have contingency plans, scenarios to really pivot uh, um, backwards and forth in this, uh, in this standoff. And um, unfortunately, uh, some companies are going to have to be forced in the not too distant future, I fear, uh, to actually choose between the two because the regulatory tensions between Chinese laws and US laws uh, and Australian laws uh, are, are going to be too great for you to, to play in all three sandpits. So if we move to the next one, um, could we just have a quick uh, bit of fun with, with polling? Could it, so if you could uh, just activate your polling functions, could I ask you, the audience, um, are you actively onshoring? Uh, any of your supply chain? Are you active, act, actively considering onshoring any of your supply chain at, at the moment? So if you could get, get voting against that question. I'll just give you a minute. Okay, that's quite interesting. Um, so we've got 24% uh, saying yes, 35% no, and 41% uh, not relevant. Um, if, I take a, if I take a calculated guess, maybe that's because uh, uh, many of those respondents either, either uh, are not, not directly dealing with, with uh, that, uh, that element of their business or their supply chains are, are, are Purely contained at a, na at a national level. Of the yes and of the yes and no's, twenty four versus versus thirty five. Um, that's actually that's a, that's actually higher than I was than I was um, expecting. There's a lot of talk about um, on onshoring. Uh, there's not a huge amount of actual action at the moment. But that really is going to that really is going to going to only move in in one direction, I think, um, because it's not simply the United States that's trying to to drag many of its companies home. The Japanese have just thrown uh, thrown several billion dollars at actually encouraging slash slash forcing their uh, manufacturers in China to reshore to Japan. And in so doing, move up the productivity and technological ladder uh, in in the process. Um, so that there's a, a lot of economies doing doing this, and the whole the whole word decoupling, which I was actually quite quite cynical about, even a, even a year ago, is really um, really gathering momentum. So just to move on to the next slide, there you go. Uh, that's the Europeans thinking about uh, thinking about. Uh, reshoring um, and um, it's a trend that's uh, not going to go away and it, as, I, as I mentioned it's uh, these governments um, and these these supranational bodies like this one um, on the one hand want to beat up companies about uh, about supply chain security uh, which you know, right now is a shorthand for don't let your supply chain uh, fall into the fall into the hands of the of the Chinese. Um, but at the same time, 
there's much less of a focus on the actual true resilience of, of, of supply chains and the need for, uh, for it to be diversified across jurisdictions so that when pandemic visits again or other, some other form of natural disaster or major political uh, risk issue, uh, companies with supply chains do actually have fallbacks and fail safes in more than one jurisdiction. So there's a real tension there. And going back to what I was saying, companies really need to sort of rev up their government relation functions to just remind their representatives of that uh, and, then, and ensure that you know, national security does not mean building your whole supply chain round of round a fence back home. So moving on to the next slide. Quick, quick second bit of poll fun. Are you thinking about um, measuring performance of your supply chain in terms of um, environment, social and governance, the acronym uh, that I mentioned that's been banded around so much at the moment. Is this a thing for you? Uh, if you could vote against that just very quickly. Yeah, there we go. Th that's quite compelling. 73% of you um, uh, are thinking about measuring the performance of your supply chain against environment, social and government's benchmarks. I mean, just move on to the next slide. Sophia, please. Uh, and that, uh, that brings that result into relief. Um, if you look at uh, those, those squiggly graphs, that's that, that's measurement of mentions during quarterly earnings calls of ESG um, since the since the Paris Agreement at just three of the major major oilies. Um, but um, the and if you look at the if you look at the bar chart in the top right corner, the number of global ESG regulations uh, is is increasing exponentially, and. Uh, there's, of course, as I mentioned earlier, a huge amount of money uh, sitting behind this. I mean, for example, Deloitte is predicting that ESG funds will account for half of all professionally managed funds in the US within uh, the next five years. So that's a growth from about $12 trillion uh, in assets to $34 trillion by 2025 and of course that's going to trickle through to supply chain management not trickle through flood through uh, and how uh, uh, how you measure your supply chain against uh, your environmental your social and your, your, your governance performance uh, I put a little quote in the bottom uh, right there from the FT that came out of Davos uh, about uh, about ESG and they were they were skeptical as to whether it would really, um, you know, it, it would really remain a thing in the face of um, uh, economic difficulty. Uh, and of course it has, COVID if anything, has really accelerated the focus on this. Uh, and if you just do social, uh, social media, you know, uh, valence, if you just Google the, the, the prevalence of that word on the front pages of fin Financial Times, all the big all the big international business papers, you can't get away from it. Um, it's it's, a, it's a, a, of huge importance and it feeds back into those five buckets of risk. Pretty much every single one of those, that, those buckets that I mentioned has got an ESG element to it. So uh, if we just quickly uh, finish up, um, just, go, just at the very operational level, you know, many of our clients, if you're going to measure whether it's ESG, whether it's uh, fraud, corruption in your, in your supply chain, many of our clients have voiced concerns about actually doing it in the time of COVID. Uh, just being able to actually get on the ground and investigate, audit, etc. cetera. Um, and I'll share these slides afterwards. But uh, there are ways to do it. Control risk does do it. We, do, we, 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 we obviously combine it with an on-the-ground network, but there's a lot of remote responses that you can deploy to make sure that, that uh, compliance um, and your, your new strategies uh, uh, around supply chain 
uh, risk uh, are actually being being under underpinned by genuine examination. So I just want to finish off with a couple of a couple of uh, if, uh, points. Um, if we move to the next slide, uh, some closing thoughts. Uh, you might find these monstr monstrously patronizing or possibly thought provoking. I apologize if it's the former, but um, I think this one, the first one is monstrous as patronizing. If you think, if you thought that your supply chain was under stress going into COVID-19, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be under even more stress coming out of it. COVID's not going to, not, no, is not going to change things uh, in terms of, in terms of supply chain stress. The, the second one though is a, is a counterpoint to that, and, and this is a reflection of a number of our clients' experience uh, that in desperate times don't rush. So if you are really thinking about redesigning your supply chain, relocating it, for goodness sake, do a comprehensive examination of actually what you've got, uh, not just from a bricks and mortar perspective, but from a, re a reputational risk perspective and a political risk perspective. Don't jump out of the frying pan into the fire based on incomplete information. Um, and that relates to the third point, by all means, you know, diversify. Diversification does uh, equal greater resilience, uh, but don't forget that uh, those, those countries and particularly China where you've been doing business for years and years are operationally still good places to do business. Uh, what you have to, of course, factor in now is the significant and growing geopolitical risk. But that washes over different sectors, different types of companies in different sort of ways. How does it wash over you? Fourth one, uh, states want to meddle in supply chains. This goes back to my government relations point. Uh, make sure you engage with states. They are open to conversations and, and the, their direction of travel can be shifted uh, either by industry bodies like the one I'm, I'm talking to today, uh, or by you as, in, as individual firms, uh, just coming up with suggestions around, uh, uh, you know, the, the real security surrounding supply chain, uh, diversification, et cetera. Next slide. And, and my final slide, uh, a long fraudulent tale is coming. You know, Warren Buffett said, you only really know uh, who's swimming naked uh, when the tide goes out and as recession kicks in so many of our clients are finding that they're facing uh, issues of serious fraud in their supply chain um, and that relates back to my slide about how you deal with that remotely uh, and this is going to be uh, an ongoing thing it's not not a flash in the pan uh, if you're doing business in Asia, any of you have done it for any length of time through the through the th through the last major recession, or even you know old real old hands who did it through through SARS or or, or the or other flu ep epidemics will know that when it imp when downturn comes to town, uh, people inside your business uh, and in your supply chain um, uh, are often caught with a hand in the till. And that relates to the next point. It's not just in, it's not just outside your business where these problems arise, look inside as well. Penultimate point, there's too many versions of the future right now. There just is. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm supposedly uh, an analyst, but I'm not going to call the US presidential election. And the, of course, the spread as I started with on supply chain risk of that outcome is potentially quite enormous. Uh, so you need to sort of build plans for alternative futures. You've got to build your scenarios. And finally, penny wise, pound foolish, nobody in Australia knew what this meant. Uh, it's, um, everybody had to Google it. It's a, it's a phrase from my grandma and it really means don't lowball it. Don't, don't, you, you know, the, the recession is kicking in, uh, but do think quite seriously about spending some proper money on updating your supply chain systems and customizing them to your specific business uses and recruiting the right people to, to maintain those systems. Uh, because if you don't, uh, it could really have a major financial impact upon you.
And with that, uh, let's go over to questions. Thank you, Steve. Fantastic. And there's a lot of questions coming through. I also welcome um, Corey as well. Thank you. Great. Um, now, I might just start um, with, uh, with rolling out all these questions. Terrific. Keep them coming through. Um, seeing as travel is restricted, um, how do you suggest we best manage our supply chains remotely, Steve? Uh, yes. So, uh, I, I, I didn't really have too much time to, to, um, to develop our remote slide. Um, there's, there's a number of different ways our clients are doing that. Um, I think uh, slightly counterintuitive to the, to, the, to the comments I made about in, in, inside a threat, uh, you do have to encourage your people on the ground uh, to perhaps expand their roles, get them to do things that they weren't used to, um, and uh, you know, push a little bit more of the executive decision-making uh, down the down the supply chain itself in a way that perhaps you weren't used to pre-COVID. Uh, then the sort of lateral responses uh, where you get um, sister organisations, um, companies like ours, to actually have a, a parallel set of eyes on your supply chain. If you're a little bit uncomfortable about what's going going uh, on with them remotely, uh, often those organisations have a have a have a bigger on the ground footprint than you do um, and uh, just really sort of simple practical measures that again are, are gruesomely obvious but you really have to sort of increase the density of your communications uh, right down the right down the chain uh, during these lock these lockdown times um, so that uh, you're not it's not simply it's not simply sort of technical dials that you're relying on but it's actually human intelligence and 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 uh, and on the ground experience from from people in those second third countries who are actually dealing with it thank you and now a question from nasia how much modern technologies for example artificial intelligence can help to reduce supply chain risk because wars pandemics environmental issues are not new to businesses that's right uh <laughs> The, the, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, it's really, you know, quite untested territory. I mean, it, I, I mean, as I think most of you who are interested in supply chain, or if, if you're opening the, opening the, the trade papers every other day, it's all about the, uh, the impact of AI on, on supply chain decision making. Um, pandemic, as an example, I, I bet most of the audience had pandemic in their sort of crisis management planning somewhere. Uh, they just uh, had no, none of us did, by the way, I'm not being condescending here. Uh, they just didn't measure the, 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 the huge global scope of what that pandemic would, would do, to their, do to their businesses. So to answer the question, I think um, the, the more dials you can watch and the more the more information you can aggregate from that from a from a broader set of sources and the more you can design that information to reflect your specific interests rather than just generic uh, generic factors um, is going to is going to certainly help inform your supply chain decision making but you know the, the human intelligence and uh, the human intelligence element to it um the 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 discursive element to it the have you know the the risk committee the making sure you've got boardroom representation element um, in terms of supply chain risk risk management is still as important as it ever it, as it ever was and i don't think um you, you know, moving up the up the technological ladder is actually actually going to negate that it's got to be Thank a collaboration you. between the two Thank you. Uh, anonymous question: How can we trust China's recovery scorecard? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, uh, I mean, the inference there is that China s salts its figures, uh, and that that is a that is a legitimate thing to say. 
China uh, has track record for that. Um, the answer is you can't, but uh, that point on our little chart, I think, does reflect the the anecdotal evidence that we collect on the ground. Um, our largest business business in Asia is in China, where we we were at three, we were in Beijing, uh, Shanghai, and and Hong Kong, and we know most of the major major businesses uh, in China, both foreign and Chinese, and um, and uh, their sense of it is that, that that's a that's a pretty reasonable spot where where we've where we've got it. Okay, thanks. Another another anonymous. Which APAC um, country will stand to gain um, from countries exiting their manufacturing and decoupling their supplies from China, supply chains from China? Okay, well, I mean, I spoke about about Vietnam at perhaps a little bit a little bit too much length. Everybody loves Vietnam because um, don't tell the Vietnamese this, but uh, a lot of people presume it's it's quote unquote a sort of little China. Uh, that's actually not not true at all. It has its own major challenges, uh, including uh, red hot real estate sector, uh, limited capacity, uh, massive amounts of corruption, much higher levels of corruption relative to to China. But nevertheless, it has the red carpet well and truly out for foreign investors and that's the key distinction china is now a place china's not not exactly rolled the red carpet up but it's very much of the attitude of like you know if you want to do business here that's fine but we don't really care because we're quite big and powerful now uh, so it's entirely up to you is how i sort of crudely characterize it whereas vietnam is still keen on, on really picking up a lot of the, the the business that's exiting China, but don't forget Thailand. The, the whole sort of eastern seaboard development there is uh, is also designed to suck up uh, uh, investment exiting exiting China. The Indonesians, dare dare I dare I say it, um, President Joko Widodo with his with his you know omnibus labour reform bill that's that's crawling through 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 Parliament right now. Who knows? May actually finally get Indonesia to a place where it can start to benefit somewhat from from where it should really be, which is a, it should really be a a regional manufacturing superpower, rather than simply a you know a resource exporter, which is what it is at the moment. Um, but really. Uh, I think uh, the, the the ones the ones best placed to benefit uh, from di from divestment for China are uh, Thailand, Taiwan, uh, Japan at the higher end, um, and then at the, at the lower end places like uh, like Vietnam. Right. Thanks, Steve. Um, we've got some great questions coming through. So we, we're going to continue a little bit past one, if that's okay with everybody, um, to get through some of these questions. Um, a question from Alan. Our China agents are doing audits on Chinese suppliers regarding modern slavery. How do you think Chinese suppliers will respond to this? Um. Difficult one to to answer. Uh, it, it it's going to vary a lot by by sector. But you know, as I as I mentioned, a lot of Chinese suppliers are extremely internationalized and extremely sophisticated. And when they see a global compliance uh, opportunity uh, coming down the pike in a way that they can differentiate themselves from the ties of the Vietnamese by moving quicker on it and being more enthusiastic about it. Uh, uh, time and again, our, our, our clients doing doing supply chain in China have actually found found uh, found them really receptive to change. Uh, where it gets tricky is where some of these international standards and regulations start to bump up against what uh, what the Chinese state has to say. Uh, but in terms of in terms of modern modern slavery provisions, I don't think it's that controversial. Thank you. And a question from Knut. Um, do you think the providers of supply chain software technology were prepared for the pandemic or are they now catching up 
by developing and adding new functionality. I, I'll probably throw that one back to the audience. I think uh, given just the, the you know, the, the number of companies that were running supply chain technology and, and coupled with the number of companies that were completely blindsided by the scale and damage of global pandemic, I'd probably say the answer uh, was no. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because pandemic was not a black swan event, which by definition, I think is something that just drops completely out of the blue and blindsides you. You know, Asia has form for this. Um, we've had SARS, you know, we've had H5N1. Um, I remember talking about it a couple of years ago at our sort of annual annual risk event and sort of making some glib comment about, well, CNN's not talking about it, therefore it's not a thing. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, 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 I think uh, they are playing a game of catch up. I mean, just a point that I would bring in here, given some conversations that I've had a number of the companies that I spoke to wasn't the, the technology solutions they had themselves. It was the fact that the decision making that they needed to do with whatever information they had in there, they found quite difficult. And so I think much in the way that people think, oh, I have insurance and therefore I don't need to worry about, you know, fire safety. Well, of course not. Um, the, the technology itself, the ability to have full pictures and exposure and all the rest of it, it, does, it didn't necessarily take into account some of the interconnectedness they were looking at. It didn't take into account how do we make a decision about criticality? How do we make a decision where to put resources? They had only gone this far and they didn't understand understand because no one could have as Steve said the complexity that we were dealing with there was a whole level of decision making up here that was not the technology was not enabled and none of the teams really knew where to start initially and I remember in those first few weeks really from my perspective when it was just China everything still seemed manageable it was the minute Italy went into lockdown was when red flashes started going everywhere when people started really understanding that this was no longer going to be a localized or even an Asia-ized issue. This was a global issue and they simply didn't have the decision-making bandwidth to look at so many variables coming up at once. So that would just be my, my two cents that I observed from some fairly panicked, always for some reason, very late night conversations with people. Thanks. Thanks, Corey. Um, question, a question from Alice um, with regards to what's, what our role, SIP's role, is in terms of driving and, um, and concerning governments all over the world to work collaboratively to enable streamlined global supply chain operation and service under such unprecedented, unprecedented um, pandemic terms. Thanks, Alice, for the question. Um, I don't think it's uh, SIP's role to, you know, work collaboratively with government, but I think um, where we work is in terms of uh, supporting the public and the private sector professionals alike and really, really driving the professional standards and raising those professional standards within the profession. And also, um, you know, uh, promoting best practice and, and demonstrating from that way as an independent professional body. But thanks for your, for your question, Alice. Um, we're just going to ask a few more questions and go a little bit past the hour because this is a fantastic conversation. So thank you. Um, uh, which one will I go to now? Um, from Alan. Uh, no, we've had Alan. Uh, right. Uh, companies moving away from China as they realise the risk to fully depending on a country to produce for the world, but moving away has got to be sustainable in terms of availability of talent, existence and efficiency of the local supply chain, etc. Um, and one of the great advantages, or this might be a corner, that, and one of the great advantages of staying in China is the availability of the huge local market, which is not available in many other countries. Do you think the move is going to be permanent or temporary, as there are many factors that need to come into play? Yeah, I, I think that's a, a, a good th good point. I hope in my sort of chat I answered the first the first point. But, you know, it's a very good point about China being a huge market in its own right, which I didn't address. I was kind of thinking more in terms of manufacturing for, for export. But, of course, so many of our clients do face that huge dilemma because so much of their growth strategy is actually wrapped up in manufacturing in China for China. Uh, and 
you know, my, my, my opening point about future proofing, those are the types of clients who are asking us to, to do that because they, they want to stay uh, in that, in that market, but they have huge obligations to often, uh, us regulators. Um, and so they want to walk that, walk that tightrope and it is getting harder and harder to do that. Um, uh, going back to my presidential election point, I think it will get clearer under a Biden presidency as to how you do that versus a, versus a, a, a Trump presidency. But regardless of, of which it's, it's, it's going to get harder. It is mm -hmm. going to get harder. And that means you've got to have more nimble government relations people. You've got to, to, to build out your scenarios. You've got to think about segments of your China business uh, that you might have to shut down because they're just too sensitive, that kind of thing. And those are the kind of conversations we are having at the moment. Okay, we might just take one or two more questions. And this one's from Brian. As uncertainties are swinging between extremes, what are some of the mitigation strategies that you can recommend to mitigate against COVID devastating effects, particularly for SMEs? Corey, do you want to have a go at that one? <laughs> I, I actually saw this one come up and I was, I was thinking mm. about it and I was trying to think of the kind of practical strategies. And I think the, the immediate thing that come out to me, the, the, again in English, the immediate thing that comes out to me, particularly for SMEs who might not have the same level of sophistication in their understanding of their supply chain and particularly their secondary and their tertiary supply chain. So, you know, they might understand the factory that makes their big widget, but they don't think about where the constituent parts come into and all the rest of it. And with some of the smaller Australian companies, um, and I'm thinking here particularly on the extractives, which I deal with, they hadn't understood the totality of their supply chain exposure. And um, one client I work with in particular found that they thought they were fine. They'd taken a look at their supply chain. They didn't have a massive exposure in China. And so they didn't worry about it too much. Come to find out that the key component in these factories only came from China and that they, they basically had to shut down their operations for a number of weeks while they worked out alternative sources. And so I think it's about making sure that you have the full view of your supply chain. Um, and I'm speaking to SMEs here because I think this is a bit, um, this is probably a bit simplistic for the larger companies, but understanding if you have this, the full view and the full view of the ecosystem and then understanding what are the vulnerabilities along each point there? And there's the physical vulnerabilities, you know, do they, are they reliant on one port, whatever that is, but then there's also the political vulnerabilities. And Steve was speaking about how, for example, in China, some sectors may be more impacted than other sectors. You know, if we know that China is going after American microprocessor manufacturers, then you need to understand what your exposure is to that political issue, not just the operational issues. And it's a, it's a very complicated number of variables that you, have to, that you have to keep track of, but there's no point in doing that if you don't understand the ground truth and the, and the full ecosystem. So that would probably be my, the key thing I saw as being an issue for, for SMEs was just that, that lack of true visibility and then a lack of understanding about where their vulnerabilities lay. Terrific. Thank you. Look, we might just take uh, closing remarks from you both and, and wrap up for today. Fantastic conversation. But um, Steve, we might start with you with closing remarks. Um, thanks, Sharon. Um, I guess I, 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 guess I, I, I close as I, as I began. Um, I think uh, for all of us, uh, the pandemic has really seen, a, seen an acceleration of, of of trends in supply chain risk that were already fully underway, uh, you know, that the arc of their of their travel is just going to uh, going to pick up pace. Whether it's um, compliance with the ESG or the need to pay attention to to to, to the U.S. China tr trade feud, um, it is making life for those of you in in, in supply chain management um, much harder, and it's also forcing you to be. Uh, uh, a lot more strategic uh, about it, but I think if you get uh, if you get your you know your your, your points of analysis, uh, your monitoring, your tech um, together, and you also have the have the ear ear of the board, if you like, that that recognises just how 
how important the, your, your element of, of, of the business is to the existence of your business. Um, and I think pandemic has really helped you in that regard. Um, then um, you know the, the the future shouldn't uh, shouldn't feel as as daunting as perhaps the headlines suggest. Kari, thanks. I guess what I would say is, particularly as I am sitting down here with you guys in ANZ, that the the newspaper headlines and the the kind of press coverage and indeed even the the political dialogue can sometimes rush decisions, and that there is. There's a lot of very um, persuasive argument in papers now, et cetera, to say we need to be diversifying from China or whatever it is, and we need to do it right away. And I would just say back to Steve's point about making sure that you're making measured decisions and measured steps, and that you know now in particular is not the time to to rush into decisions, but equally just make sure that you have all the all the information at your fingertips when you are making the decisions, and um, that certainly. If there's any further questions, if anyone would like any of the detail that Steve spoke about today, I'm very happy to provide that. I'm on time zone with some of you, although I see there's some crazy people dialing in from places like the United Kingdom. Um, so at three, three in the morning, I hope this was interesting enough to keep you awake, but certainly we are down here to support. Terrific. Thanks, Corey. And thank you, Steve, for your presentation today. Um, just to Corey's point, we're actually going to address all the unanswered questions. We'll provide them in writing post webinar. So thank you and sorry that we didn't get through all the questions. But thanks, Steve, again, for presenting such an thought-provoking um, presentation. Thank you, Corey, also for your contribution. Um, terrific. I just got a little announcement in terms of what's coming up next. Um, over the, we've got a jam-packed few weeks over the next uh, couple of weeks. SIPS Australasian Supply Management Digital Awards. Now that's happening on Wednesday. 29th of July and it's an event not to be missed. It's uh, the night of nights for procurement and we're delighted we're actually going digitally. So the awards will be on Wednesday the 29th. They'll start from 5pm Eastern Standard Time for Australia and 7pm for those in New Zealand. And this is the first year that we're going to be hosting a live and free event. So I do hope you'll join us to hear from the best of the best in procurement. Uh, we are also running a web on the 27th of July, Fraud, Risk and Cyber Security. So join us to hear from two experts, Mark Sayer, a Cyber Defence Lead at Accenture, and Kieran Strain, uh, Director of Client Development, Enterprise and Public Sector at ANZ SAP Concur, as they are going to be discussing fraud, risk, compliance and cyber security on Monday the 27th of July, so don't miss this. And this one is going to be an absolute cracker. Game Theory in Negotiation, 29th of July, again another one not to be missed. Now this is a Victorian branch webinar, a SIPS Victorian branch webinar on the topic of Game Theory in Negotiation. Again, Wednesday the 29th of July from 12.30 in Australia and 2.30 in New Zealand and presented by Professor Vivek um, Sean Dream, um, he, and that he's the Academic Director, Executive MBA programs from the University of Melbourne Business School. So fantastic lineup um, to, to, um, to complement today's presentation. You can um, find all the details on these webinars on the SIPS Australia and New Zealand LinkedIn channel or on our website. But to all attendees and to our presenters, thank you again. To all attendees, we hope you found the webinar insightful today. Before you leave today, please just take a few moments to do the post-webinar survey and a copy of the webinar and a list of unanswered questions, as I said, will be emailed to you at, um, at, at next, during next week. So thanks again. Take care. Keep safe. Bye.